a joy to be together on this Lord's Day and to honor our Father in Heaven and to congratulate the men among us who are fathers and to exhort one another to be even more a reflection of the image of the one who is our example above. This past week, Camp Keller was a tremendous success out at Bear Creek Park. Everyone enjoyed a super time and fellowship and study and lessons as very one else ones came out to teach. This happy group, don't we have some outstanding young people in this congregation? And great leadership too. Look at these happy couples. After spending a week with 30 teenagers, they're still smiling and they're talking about doing it again next year. I think the Carrillos and the Bruces will make outstanding parents one day, no pressure, because they've already survived teenagers. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 indicates so much of what goes into the role of an effective father. Here we've heard admonition, approval, acceptance, appreciation, authority. And Paul the Apostle speaks to the brothers and sisters in Corinth and he says, I love you. That's the reason I am writing as I do. And he speaks of Timothy as his beloved child, his son, whom he will send to them. And he gives them the option. Shall I come to you with a rod? We can do this the hard way. Or with love and a spirit of gentleness. I'm thinking so much about my own dad today. I'm wearing one of his ties. And yesterday, of all things, two identical pieces of mail came to our house. Identical, just two different addressees. Each one was offering orthopedic care and possible knee surgery. One was addressed to Corey Collins. The other, believe it or not, was addressed to Ken Collins, my dad. My dad would be 100 years old if he were here today. As Tanya and I were going through some of our keepsakes, we remember this bookmark that my dad would give to people as a method of outreach, abundant living. Pray, it is the greatest power on earth. Love, it is a God-given privilege. Read, it's the fountain of wisdom. Think, it's the source of power. Be friendly, it's the road to happiness. Give, it is too short a day to be selfish. Play, it is the secret of perpetual youth. Laugh, it is the music of the soul. Work, it is the price of success. Save, it is the secret of security. Best wishes, Ken Collins. What if there were a major in school that would prepare men to be fathers? What courses would be involved and what exercises and homework and how would you get a high score? You know, as a man, I wish when I were in high school I had learned how to balance a checkbook and how to change a flat tire, but even more so, to be prepared for the role of fatherhood. What a tremendous and awesome privilege it is as well as a great responsibility. Think about the children that God has given us to raise and the strength, the character, the integrity, the maturity, the generosity, the faithfulness that we want to be in their lives. And then we take that as our checklist and that's what we aim to be and present ourselves. Authenticity is such a tremendous value because, as one writer said, you can con a con and you can fool a fool, but you can't kid a kid. Actions speak louder than words. And our efforts at being consistent, being genuine, being open and transparent, even with our flaws, there's not a perfect father among us. And in this lesson, as we remind ourselves of things we want to be and to do and to aim for as fathers, it is as fallible human beings saved by the grace of God. But our sons and daughters will realize even that, that we are 
willing to admit our need to grow, our errors and our faults as well. Relationship, that's the key to the rules that we have as dads. If we have only rules without relationship, the result will be resentment and rebellion. But in the context of love and warmth and togetherness and openness, then our children understand that the limits and the laws and the boundaries and the prohibitions grow out of that bond that we share as we're all engaged together to help our children become servants of God. I found this word art, it has some great terms on it, empathetic, contributes, considerate, self-reliant, facilitates. I'm not going to preach on all of those words, but I love every one of them. Instead, I'm going to use an outline that I found in a book how to Be a Hero to Your Kids by Josh McDowell and Dick Day. And it's effective only because it reflects what the Word of God teaches, and we're going to use it in that way. We'll talk about the foundation, we'll talk about the support, and then windows that help open up our connection with our children, and then the roof of authority and accountability. But let's start with this idea that our children need, first of all, to know that we are under them, holding them, lifting them, and that no matter how they might fall, they can always land on us. This is that which we appreciate about the God of heaven, the everlasting arms, and the fact that when we're weak and when we're in need, he, he is always there, and that foundation never moves, it never changes, and so the grace of God, when we were yet sinners, helpless, ungodly, enemies of God, Romans 5, 6 through 11, he sent his son to die for us, he loved us when in many ways we were unlovable, he accepted us when we were unacceptable, and because of that, we learn from him to give our children that security, that sense of identity, that starts in the home. And so the first element is going to be acceptance. It's a no matter what commitment. I love you, you belong, you're special. We want you in our home and I as a dad, I'm thankful to take you in and include you in my life and my time and my activities. Acceptance in scripture is such a key idea. It's the basis of security and self-worth. In fact, in Romans 15, 5 through 7, welcome one another. How? As Christ has welcomed you to the glory of God. What God gave me, first of all, was the willingness to take me just as I am, without one plea. Now, he won't let me stay that way, and I want, don't want to remain like that. But this sense of accepting the child, loving him or her for who they are, and because of that, they can accept themselves. I think this is the primary thing that my father gave me. I always felt like I belonged to him. And when things might have come up between us, there was still this underlying idea that he, he accepted me, he, he cared about me. You know, from the time a child is born, we understand this. And so whatever they are, whatever they learn, at whatever rate they grow, even when they get sick and spit up, we just accept them for who they are. But if we're not careful, as they grow older, we switch over to a performance-based acceptance. And if you do this, I will accept you, and if you don't, then I won't. Now, those aspects of authority and discipline and correction and punishment, they have their place, but they are effective as the roof over the house because underlying it all is this atmosphere, this connection, this openness that involves acceptance. And because of that, our children know who they are 
and it must come first, and then the rest will more easily fall into place. So you grab every opportunity to let them know whether they win or lose life's daily challenges and battles. Just like me, they're human. They need grace and help. They need blessing and care and forgiveness. They'll have good days like I do and bad days like I do, but acceptance remains constant. Not endorsing wrong behavior, but valuing the child, allowing for differences of opinion and personality, giving room and time to grow and mature. It was Dorothy Law Nolte that wrote, if children live with criticism, they learn to condemn. With hostility, they learn to fight. With ridicule, to be shy. If children live with shame, they learn to feel guilty. With encouragement, they learn confidence. With tolerance, they learn to be patient. With praise, they learn to appreciate. With acceptance, they learn to love. With approval, they learn to like themselves. With honesty, they learn truthfulness. If children live with security, they learn to have faith in God, in themselves, and others. If children live with friendliness, they learn that the world is a nice place in which to live. What God did for us as our Father, we choose deliberately to do for our children. And whatever we would want Him to provide, to pardon, to change, to teach, we reflect that in our home. Well, the second bottom layer is appreciation. It's the idea of catching our children doing something good and then reinforcing it and rewarding it. Letting them know when they excel at something that we're proud of them. That doesn't affect our love. We would love them just as much if they had not made whatever the goal was. But because they did, we rejoice with them and we spur them on and we commend their talent and their attitude and their diligence. In Matthew 25, 21, there's the master saying, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we want our father to say to us. And Jesus spoke in Luke 12 of coming back and finding the servants and then he serves them. What a remarkable paradox it is that the Lord of Lords would wait on the table with us as the ones being honored. Oh, words of praise. Isn't that what you most wanted to hear from your parents? Well done. I'm so honored to be your dad or your mom. I appreciate the effort you made and the fact that you tried. Oh, man, you took out the garbage. That's really cool. You straightened up your room. You were nice to your kid brother or sister. You dressed yourself. You opened the door for your mom. And looking for those things makes such a tremendous difference. Now let's talk about two A's that might serve as windows to kind of shed light and open up uh, this interaction with our children. The first is availability. Someone said that love is spelled T-I-M-E. The fact is, quantity time allows for quality within that time. I remember hearing a story of a little girl whose dad was always too busy for her. He was working. He had things going. He had to stay at his job because that's what made the money and provided for the home. And he knew that, but she didn't quite get it. So one day she knocked on his door working at home and she said, Daddy, can I buy an hour of your time? All other things are in a sense uh, perhaps a substitute, an excuse for giving ourselves. There's no amount of money, there's no number of toys, there's no excess of activities that is the same as dad opening his eyes, opening his heart, his ears, his mind, and opening his schedule so that every time daddy comes home, if you've got little kids, they get excited. Older kids maybe don't show it quite as much, but I guarantee you that the time you spend with each one is the greatest gift you can provide. That availability is what we see in the life of Jesus. It says, in effect, you're important. 
I'm going to set aside some other things and even other people and other opportunities because I want to focus on you. I don't want to miss this moment in your life. There's only one time that that child will be at that particular age and it will never come again. And many of us who are older now and our children are grown, we wish we had understood more the importance of availability. Have any of you ever heard that it's easier being grandparents than parents? Having a grandchild is a precious thing. But I think the change has come not with the children we had compared to grandchildren, with what, what's happened to dad when he became a granddad. And as all of us, perhaps, whose children are out of the nest, and we, we reflect, and, oh, I wish I had been more patient. I, I wish I had seized the moment. I wish I had not got so caught up in X, Y, and Z. And now with our grandchildren, we've learned that lesson that perhaps we wish we'd known a long time ago. Again, no perfect parents, or grandparents for that matter. Availability. Think of the times that Jesus would stop what he was doing to minister, to interact, to listen. Think of the woman in John 4 at the well. He was tired. It was midday. He sat down as a human being. He needed water. As far as we know, he never got that water. Instead, he talked to a thirsty woman about what could happen in her life. How often would Jesus be going somewhere and somebody would stop him? Oh, I think of Mark 10, 35 to 45. Blind Bartimaeus and Jesus and the crowd are on their way between Jericho and Jerusalem and this beggar starts shouting. And the crowd wants to shush him. No availability there. And Jesus halts them in their place and asks Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? That is the available Father. What are you interested in? What would you like us to do together? Perhaps it's a date with a daughter, or it's a getaway with a son, or it's a game at home, or maybe it's just sitting and talking and taking the Word of God and reading and praying and thinking and talking about our relationship with Him. We can so easily get caught up. In fact, we can think while running the rat race of all the extra stuff there is for our kids to do that we're being available for them. That has its place. But there's nothing like face-to-face -face in the same room.